on my live. Good afternoon. Um, I suppose I'm live. Um, I'll just wait a few minutes. I didn't. I didn't tag anyone in this post today, but I'll. I'm a bit late. But I'll give you a couple of minutes. Perhaps somebody wants to join. Hi, welcome. Just say hello and let me know who you are. And um, perhaps I can tag a few people, or I'll just go ahead with this um, live streaming. So, or maybe should I wait? Tell me who you are, whoever you are. I'd love to know who you are. Um, so, I'm going to go ahead, whether I have um, members in the audience or not listening, because I'm just going to go ahead. So, let me just start by saying that everything that happens as painful as it may be, is a divine intervention. I've come to see that things have happened in my life with divine timing. As much as I hated being in that space and not understanding why I found myself in particular situations, in hindsight, I always realized that there was a gift in the situation I found myself in. Last night I saw a movie called Two Hearts, based on a true story. And as I was, you know, skimming through, what's not the word skimming, scanning through movies on what I could see in the evening, this this one, I was drawn to it, and I looked at the trailer, and I saw it was based on a true story, and I decided to press play. And immediately, it drew me in. And it's a story about two parallel lives, um, and the, the person... Um, how do you say that? You know, when they're relating a story, when they're kind of in the background relating a story, I forgot the name of that, called Amusing Words. So he was acting and also relating and sharing. The narrator, the narrator was the actor himself. And he was talking about his mother and the wisdom of his mother. And it's a... a a sentence I'm pretty sure many of us heard before, or at least I've heard it time and time again. And it relates to what I just started with. And that what he said was, life doesn't happen to us, it happens for us. And life in and of itself and everything that happens is a miracle. And all you have to do is look for the miracle and that's for me difficult to understand even though i believe it simply because i'm the type of person who's like saint thomas i don't know if you know saint thomas and he had to he he didn't believe that christ was risen what he said was i'd really have to poke my finger in, in his wounds to know that he's risen and for me it's like I rely more on, on the tangible, on the form, than I do in what I don't see. And by the end of this movie, and it's based on a true story, okay, I was in bits, I was touched, I was moved. It is so beautiful, so, so beautiful. I'm not going to mess it up for you, I recommend it to you, it's called Two Hearts. And it's based on the life of Christopher Gregory and what happened 
But don't look it up, just watch the movie. So, this, this conversation and why this introduction? The 50 year long journey of a four year old. And I called this episode, I don't know if there'll be more episodes, but I called this one the band aid. And before I dive into um, the weeks preceding Fudge's death, I think it would be fair to um, share with you guys how Fudge came into my life and why I think things are divinely given and timed and why she spent 17 and a half years with me. Um, so, I lived with a friend. <laughs> I went to visit for one night and that night turned into eight years. Um, I'm not going to get into details why I went to visit because that will become another story. During that time, my friend wanted a dog. And it was his apartment, but he worked three shifts. He was a very busy man. He, he had very little time to be home, but he wanted a dog. So what I said to him, right, you want a dog, which means that if we do get a dog, I'll be the one caring for the dog. And I'm not really up for that. And so I resisted for a little while, but ultimately it was his home. So, <laughs> if it's his home, you gotta get a dog now. And we had two cats and, you know, we agreed that we would adopt a dog that wouldn't invade the territory of the cats. Or and that we would get a dog that was smaller so that they would try to get on. Uh, with each other and they, the cats wouldn't feel so threatened by the size of a large dog. Anyway, we agreed, a friend of his um, had a dog, a Yorkshire Terry, who was pregnant and we decided to adopt one of these dogs or to buy one of these dogs at the time. But um, I had to go on a trip, I went abroad, I went abroad for work and um, when I came back I found that my ex-flatmate had decided to adopt another dog that was going to, apparently, they were going to leave the island, they needed a quick adoption, and Frederick just thought, okay, great, I'll take this dog, which was, which was a good deed. But when I went home, Lucy, that was her name, bit me and my then ex-girlfriend three times within the hour. I thought, hmm, she's made this place her home, this is her territory, and I, I'm the invader. And I remember going up to my flatmate, whose name is Fred, I'd rather give him a name, and I said to him, it's either me or Lucy, and happily, <laughs> he chose me, because he could have said, right, this is my home, that's my dog, just get out, but I was lucky enough, our relationship was very old, very, we had been friends for years, and he gave up his dog, which was very sad, very sad for me, very sad for him, and it, it broke his heart. So I thought to myself, right, I, I just can't have this, this is my best friend, we're living in the same house, his heart is broken, so let's just go and get another dog. And I never wanted a dog, never because I was brought up in an environment where I was taught to dislike dogs because they make the house dirty, because they're responsibility, because you have to take care of them, because I have a lot of things. So I had this belief in my mind. But notwithstanding that, I thought, uh-uh, this ain't right. So I went to the SPCA and I, as soon as I walked in, I saw this little puppy jumping up and about, she was really excited, really happy to see me. The volunteer, they let her out of the cage, she took, took two steps forward, peed, took three steps backwards, took another two steps forward, peed again, but it, it was love at first sight. And I thought, there she is. And then for 
I don't know, there's another word. Just to make sure that I choose the right dog, because I had already chosen, but I didn't want to be so, so blatant about it, I went upstairs to see if there was a dog that was less afraid, more obedient, because Fudge wasn't the most of obedient of dogs. She was very headstrong, just like me. And I went upstairs and there was this largish dog, very obedient. I could lift her up. She stayed in my arms, legs up, you know. She was lovely. I don't remember if it was she or a he. But anyway, I went home. I went to Fred and I said, listen, there are two dogs that we can't choose from. You want the dog. I'll leave the choice up to you. And I was saying to myself, please choose such, please choose such. But I didn't say that out loud. I just let him choose. And he went there and he chose Fudge. So I said, right, you want the dog? Go and pick her up. But he said, no, I'm too busy. I can't. You go and pick her up. And in hindsight, he was still mourning Lucy. So I went to pick up Fudge myself. And um, as they say, the rest is history. Fudge came into my life. And you know, they say we save dogs, but they save us. And um, immediately in the house, in the flat, she followed me wherever I went. When I laughed, she just jumped up and down on my lap and kissed me all over. And basically, she chose me. And as much as I passed her on to Fred, because I still didn't want her. She wanted to stay on my lap. We went out in the evening. She wanted to stay on my lap. She wanted to be with me. And I just didn't want her. So I just kept passing her on to Fred. But she wouldn't have it. She chose me. And, um, so then I, when it was time to leave Fred's house after eight years, I had bought my own apartment. I had bought the apartment round about the time that I moved in with him, but I was afraid to go and live alone. But then I decided that it was time. And when it was time to go, Fred said to me, She's not my dog, you have to take her with you. So I did. Well, needless to say, um, that was 17 and a half years ago, more than 17 and a half years ago now. And um, now she's gone. And um, The reason I want to talk about this is apart from I think that it helps me to sort out the cobwebs and the pain that I'm going through and the anxiety that I'm feeling. Maybe the anxieties become bigger because we find ourselves, all of us find ourselves in a very strange era in our lives. I guess part of it is collective anxiety but part of it is my own and it's old and the times leading up to Fudge's death I was scared shitless <laughs> and I was powerless to change it I could see it happening day after day after day after day and um, I think she had arthritis and people kept telling me, you will know when it's time, you will know when it's time. But as it, as it were, and as, as old as guilt is, something that we've inherited from generations before us, and from religion, and from what have you, from parents, I was feeling guilty that I should have ended her life earlier than I did, but somehow I held on and I tried to enjoy as much of her company as possible. I tried to make her as comfortable as possible. Um, the 
some time ago in October when the pandemic um, was, well, it wasn't as it's at its height. I don't know if we can't if it really, is, the, is there a height? It seems to be es escalating day by day. But I had a job and I was fired because of the measures that were taken and I was up for a getting a faster contract. What's faster contract? Um, a binding contract, one which they couldn't find me with. Um, I can't remember the name of it now, I'm thinking in Dutch. And um, they laid me off. So at first I was really sad and I was really sorry, but then I thought to myself, these are Fudge's last months. We don't know when she's gonna die, so you can't just enjoy her company. And from October up to February, I was at home. And I really could enjoy her company. And I dreaded, really dreaded leaving her alone when I had to go back to work. Because she was really, by February, she was really, um, Uh, regressing quite steadily. So what Fudge did for me, what Fudge's death did for me, it pulled a band-aid, it covered up the patterns that I had about believing that I'm not a lovable person and that nobody could love me and because and it her death uncovered it because whilst I was in it I could see what I was doing I was praying to God for God to take her the most natural way in her sleep but as much as I prayed God wasn't listening and Fudge had a really good heart. I remember looking up and swearing at him, really swearing, screaming at the top of my voice saying, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> you call yourself God? And um, I remember holding her in my arms, rocking her and telling her, you can go, but at the same time saying, please don't go because if you go, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm in a country, I'm alone. I don't have a steady friendship, one person that I can call my own. And if you leave, that's it, I'm alone. And I spent some months, some weeks, if not months, feeling like this. But then in the last week, she couldn't stand. She couldn't relieve herself on her own. I had to help her for her baby to, to do her weaning and, and all she needed to do. And then on the Thursday before I put her to sleep, because I had to put her to sleep, I just knew it was time. And I pulled a Band-Aid. I, I call it a Band-Aid because Fudge helped me. She helped me to see patterns. She helped me to see what I was doing to myself, how I didn't feel love, how needy I was. She helped me see that unconditional love is possible. And not just from dog to, to human, not just from species to species, but from homo sapiens to homo sapiens, from human to human. Unconditional love is possible. And the space that she has left right now has opened me up to exploring, to really exploring my pains, the pains that I've kept hidden for years and years and years. And I remember as a child deciding, I think, the earliest recollection I have of not feeling loved is when I was four years old. I was in um, 
I was in the playground in kindergarten. I remember looking up, there were trees, and I said to myself, nobody really loves me. Nobody can really take care of me. So I'll just go from one group to another, you know, how we group up as friends, as children. And I'll just give them enough time to not reject me. And I did this unknowingly and as a form of self-preservation. But I carried it on to my, to being an adult, to my adulthood. And I notice now, since I, since she's died, how I ended up in the Netherlands. Well, I ended up in the Netherlands because I fell in love. And I don't regret it. But I could have gone back home after three and a half years. And I chose to be here. I chose to, to see if I could make it on my own. And I've been here on my own for nearly nine years now. So I've been in the Netherlands for 12 and a half years. Half of which, no more than half. Since 1st October 2012, I've been living on my own. So was it all doom and gloom? No. Um, what, what has happened for me is that during when Fudge was alive, I noticed that I was addicted to chocolate and to sugar, and I just would eat mindlessly. And the, day, the days and the weeks working up to Fadi's death, I had taken a decision that I wanted to heal. And I think I've said enough for today. I feel as if I'm going around in circles. I, I just, today I wanted it to be more about of an introduction as to how, what I'm seeing, and my biggest revelation is thinking that nobody loves me or that nobody could love me and finding out that it's not true. And ironically, it's not, the, the, the love of fudge helped me realize that unconditional love is possible, but her space, the space she left behind helped me to realize and look more at, at what I had done to myself than when she was alive. So her death has brought me a gift, the gift of being able to look at places I was really afraid to look. And now I'm looking and I'm healing. It's tough. It's confusing, it's painful, it's also frightening at times, but I'm healing. And that's all I'm going to share today. I will have another live streaming sometime soon. I will share more. I will share more of what I've, I've seen for myself, how I'm growing and um, I, I hope this has been helpful. Thank you for joining me. I see that there are three of you who remained here listening. Um, if this has been helpful, please let me know in the comments. If there are things you'd like to know that maybe might help you, please also let me know. And I'll see you next time. Thank you very much for listening.